My name is Jamar Wakefield, and I'm the Digital Content Manager here at WBGO. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with musician Tamar Kali, who is the composer for the film Little Richard, I Am Everything, which recently placed in the U.S. Documentary Competition at the 2023 Sundance Film Festival. Uh, Tamar, welcome to WBGO. Thank you for having me. I'm so stoked to talk to you today about this film and, and your music. Before we get into Little Richard and, and all things fabulousness, um, talk to me about your relationship with music across genre, um, your earliest memories of music. Um, I'm a second generation musician. My dad was a bass player. And in general, music was an integral part of life um, growing up as a um, a black girl in Brooklyn um, in the time that I was being reared in Brooklyn, music coming out of windows, music coming out of cars. And also with my Southern background, um, my mom being Gullah Geechee and me living with my family in the summers and just those ethnocultural African-American musical traditions that I was exposed to. Um, even though I grew up Catholic in the North, when I would go down South, I would be surrounded by the blues and gospel. And, you know, in general, my family's pretty musical. My aunt sang as well. So there was always some type of melody or sound um, or parties, whatever. Like music was a huge part of my life in general, just kind of like, you know, another thing you do other than eat and sleep and dream, you dance, you sing, you know? Um, so I think that that's important that it was just like an integral part of life. Um, in terms of learning to write music and be a performer, that happened pretty early on because my dad was um, a musician. And so my first lessons were at home. Um, but from there, going into school, I became a choral classical singer because I was Catholic. And so classical music came into my life from that frame of, you know, of reference. Wow. I love that. So it sounds like music, it's just always been there for you, right? Mm -hmm. the, 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 the landscape of your life. You know, this film includes the testimonials from musicians and cultural figures, as well as Black and queer scholars, and of course, Pennyman's family and friends. And of course, we hear from Little Richard himself. And these collective voices come together to reclaim a history that was appropriated by white artists and the music industry. Can you talk to me about the whitewashing of Black music and then speak on how this film really is tackling the, the residue of that violence within the music industry? I think there's a longstanding well-documented tradition. And I would tell folks to watch the film because there's nothing more clear cut than seeing the archival footage. Um, and of course, this is a source for deep pain for a lot of Black folks, you know, um, you know, whitewashing, erasure. It is violence. Um, it renders you invisible when you are flesh and blood. And to have a portion of our citizenry here in America constantly feel unheard and unseen, um, it definitely does a number on your psyche in time. And then there's like the economic piece mm -hmm. where you can't make a living and survive off of the thing that you yourself created. And through its appropriation, you see people being able to create a foundation and generations of wealth um, over what was taken from you. And I think that the nuance that's missing from the conversation, it's not about different people not being able to do different types of music. It's about the erasure of the originators and, you know, the um, literally making it impossible for them to to build and grow off of what they created. When you have someone appropriate um, art and culture and basically are able to generate wealth for generations and you've been sidelined, like that is an act that needs to be repaired in some form or fashion. 
you know, I think Lisa Cortez, who really leads the creative direction on this film, wants us to go there, right? We, we, this, this film really gives little Richard all the flowers, all the credit for being the blueprint in yeah. terms of, in terms of rock and roll. Can you talk to us about your relationship with rock and roll? Because you're also, you know, one of these icons who's holding space um, in multiple spaces in terms of genre, but certainly rock and roll. Um, it's interesting. Well, one thing I want to say too, and I think it's important because yes, this film is about Little Richard, but one of the things that made me say yes was the fact that she does identify Sister Rosetta Thorpe as the person who gave him his first opportunity. So, and I, that was really important to me. Like had Sister not been mentioned, I'd been like, mm, you know, so I was very happy for that. Um, you know, I grew up in New York in the 80s and you know, the con the the concept of sound clash, um, you know, uh, mixing or intersections of things were always there. Um, especially as I've grown older, I'm very conscious about um, framing it as something unusual. I think it might be unfamiliar to the average person because it's not focused in a mainstream in mainstream spaces, but you know, intersectionality is just a part of life. It's like, you know, starting with Dr. Um, well, starting with W.E.B. Du Bois talking about double consciousness, it's just more compounded. There's more than just two frame of references that we're dealing with at any given moment. Um, people love what resonates with them. And there are a lot more people who are black that, um, resonate with aggressive and intense sound than people think. But, um, you know, it's just a matter of folks just not having that frame of reference. With my dad being a musician, I grew up listening to all kind of, kinds of music at home. And what drew me to rock, one example I, I give is, um, I remember in BLS when Queen, Another One Bites the Dust was out. That was on the radio. Mm -hmm. Total Georgie Porgy. It's like people were musicians. They were writing. They had their expression on the airwaves, and that could vary. They, You know, when you are nurtured with many sounds, your expression is reflective of that. Um, so, you know, I just, I, I just kind of bristle at, I want to make sure that, I really speak to the fact that this is not some strange phenomena. It's just that it's not given the platform of discussion. And I feel like even in the discussion of it, oftentimes there's still a marginalization that happens. And um, in the example of some of these new cultural events or festivals, say Afropunk, it's a way of kind of, instead of nodding to the 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 culture of subculture and where it comes from it's kind of just a, a way to put on a costume whether it's mm. Coachella or Burning Man it's like this is when we're going to put on our freak costume and we're going to have a moment to experiment and explore and that's fine but you know the only thing is that when people who are about that lifestyle for real really practice um you know creating music and art with these with these concepts um I think that it's important to do your dil due diligence to figure out who those people might be. And I think that they should be able to eat too. Does that make sense? <laughs> you know, just, listen, we all got to eat. The, the, that's not the problem. <laughs> that, and, that, is, that is not a game. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and you can see that as a microcosm within so-called like-minded or, you know, communities, it's like being in this bubble of America we sometimes have to look internally and notice that we are exhibiting the same behaviors within our own communities that have, we've seen, you know, things happen to us. For instance, you know, it's like, it's great to experiment and explore and you have your little festivals you go to, but if the folks who originated it can't eat, it's a problem. Just like these original art forms, rock and roll, which was slang for sex, you know, becoming this America phenomenon, going from race music, where it was like, we're going to rot the the poor, the, the white youth's brain with this Negra music. Like literally there are tons of news clips saying that to then moving into this space where, oh, 
this is ours. This has always been our thing. Um, we can do that um, among each other as well. And I, and I just think that we need to just be mindful. Like it's fine to explore and experiment, but can everybody eat? Right. Right. I think it's really interesting um, what your uh, point that you're raising. Um, I hear you talking about community in, in multiple levels, right? Because the music itself is created from community. We see in the film, you know, the places that Little Richard used to hang, right? And they, they were hanging and performing and, and playing, right? The way that creative people play, you know, with sound and with words and performing. Um, and certainly, you know, the the context of, you know, queer spaces and, and queer balls and, and, you know, all of that as well. But, you know, the music itself organically comes out of community, right? Yes. Like people are together and, and that applies to hip hop, applies to the blues, yes. applies to work songs, right? But all of it, right? Mm -hmm. And so then what happens when the music spreads outside, outside of that community. original inner community and then the moment where it almost feels like the external world is cosplaying the original community. Yes. Amen. So, and, you know, and, and two, I think it's important for us to caution, like, you know, it took a village to create a little Richard and the film shows you that. Yes. Um, I think that we all need to be more self-reflective and understanding that we have a tendency in this culture to frame things by one, one leader, one originator, one maker. And culture doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, human beings often come up with brilliant ideas, different parts of the world. You know what I mean? You can look at, you know, culture, dance, you'll, you'll see movements in different spaces, people that were thousands of miles away, because there's something about the human condition where sometimes we come to the same conclusion, not even knowing what the other person is doing, you know, but, you know, it did take a village to make Little Richard. And I think it's important that we not kind of frame some of this stuff in this very hierarchical, you know, one boss, one leader thing when it's the culture of a community, right? Right, exactly. I think that's perfectly said. You know, I had a friend tell me once uh, we were talking about music and it was in the context actually of hip hop uh, and, and pop music and, and music that, you know, they say, quote unquote, crosses over to mainstream. Right. And mm -hmm. and uh, he said to me, you know, who do who do the heroes listen to? The people we label as heroes. Right. We lift them up on pedestals. That happens. We can't avoid the fact that that does happen. So he was just like, well, who did, who did MLK listen to? Mm -hmm. Right. Because that's the, that's the lineage. Like yes. who, who inspires those folks, you know, so that I love that you brought up. Sister that's Richard. an interesting segue yeah. because when we talk about appropriation and this whitewashing of the story of rock and roll, what's so interesting is that it was a terror, a, a phenomena of terror here. Negra music, it's going to ruin all of our white youth. Right. It wasn't until folks in England got a hold of it. And then it was filtered through their experience that things really flipped around and it became this, you know, global sensation, right? right? Like the Beatles broke that, like, because it was like, it was the wrong messenger. Mm. Oh my goodness. The wrong messenger that, right. That, that, yeah. says, that says so much. Like I feel that inside because. So, and then it becomes this multi-million dollar industry and this whole phenomenon, but it was something that was homegrown that could not be accepted as is because of the messenger. One of the things that I love about this film is that I feel like you, you, you dropped the word, you know, intersectionality. I feel like we see little Richard at a crossroads of, of his identities. And for me, that feels very humanizing mm -hmm. because it, you know, we, first of all, uh, films about music and, and music people and musicians and, and comp composers, you know, anything related to music, it's, it's usually like, like the epic hero tale, or it's like a very sad, you know, and then, <laughs> then they died in the bathroom. You know what I mean? Like it's, oh, it's, it's, it's like one or the other. And for me, just seeing, you know, he was religious and also queer and a musician, right? And and mm -hmm. also like 
kind of moving between these worlds. How did you and the beautiful son? Yes, 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 yes. How did you, as a composer, approach this project creatively so that you could also continue to humanize this this piece in terms of the soundscape? Well, we started from a very expansive idea. Lisa was very clear and had very specific language around this kind of almost extraterrestrial quasar, um, you know, vibration, like, you know, um, this interstellar, almost interdimensional, you know, that, that those are the types of words we were playing with um, mm -hmm. and, we, and a, even celestial body like on earth, you know? And um, I thought that was great fodder to start developing a palette from. And, um, you know, that's what I was working from and with. And then creating these tones of the struggle within him between the sacred and the secular. So that push and pull, mm -hmm. you know, th those were the, the major elements and pieces, right? And then as you're showing his life, there's locational things, you know? So there, there's a bit of upright bass in there that gets a little jazzy or bluesy depending on the location um, in the film as we're talking about his growth into this dynamic artist that he became. Um, but we started with, we, 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 the, 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 the nucleus was in the stratosphere, you know? So we started there and then came in as opposed to from within and going out, we, we came in the other direction. It was I super expansive and then got tighter. I love that. What is the process of composing teaching you about yourself as a musician? So, you know, composition happens in so many different ways. I mean, I've been composing since I was a child, technically, but composing for film is an opportunity to really kind of develop strength outside of the very myopic personal artist, solo artist perspective, um, which I think then when I return to my solo work gives me new perspectives and just strengthens my practice. Mm -hmm. um, being able, so much of what I do as an artist and as a composer in general, it's very solitary. Mm -hmm. And um, I was an only child. I have half sisters, but I didn't live with them. Um, and as a, you know, a solitary person, often and even in my my work, um, you can you sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. So when you're working on a film and you have collaborators, and there's this process of, you know submitting things for a response, getting that feedback and revising so that you can essentially take a journey to what it will be, which requires, you know, more than just your own opinion mm -hmm. and for it to resonate with the director. Like that's, I think it's just a good practice in general. And, and it really helps to like develop my art beyond just myself. I think so many creatives would agree and identify with what you said. I had a mentor tell me, you know, once that if I could do the whole project by myself, is the vision of the project big enough? You know, and it's like, you know, as a writer and artist, we can de definitely go into our shed and, and, and get it done. And yet the, the process of working with others and being in conversation with others in, in orbit with others creatively, it, it really does push us. It, it, push, it pushes our humanity and uh, and brings us to a new a new place and a new place of understanding. I think as well. Mm -hmm. I want to switch gears and talk about what you've been up to. I love that you were involved with the uh, the Los Angeles Opera. Uh, can you tell us about We Hold These Truths? Oh, well, um, so I was commissioned by LA Opera to do. Um, a piece for their digital short series. So during COVID, opera actually did very well and mm -hmm. you know, introduced itself to brand new audiences through the digital short. And so I um, 
have been doing some work around just thinking a lot about with everything that transpired while we were in lockdown, George Floyd and um, Elijah McClain and, you know, thinking about how so often people frame these experiences from a very new or contemporary um, lens Mm -hmm. and that it's new to them or even sometimes like it's new to our country. And when people think about the civil rights movement, they often think about the 60s, but the civil rights movement where black folks are concerned in America began as of abolition, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's so much work, scholarship, art, poetry, you know, pertaining to the process thereafter. Um, And the basic, basic people are just quite unfamiliar. And it's one of those things where, especially right now, with what we're dealing with the educational system in America, it's interesting. But so many of us, dating back to the double consciousness, a lot of what we've learned about our cultural history was at home. You did not get it at school. Yes. I didn't learn about Tuskegee in school. I didn't learn about um, Benjamin Banneker in school. I didn't, there's so much that I could tell you that I didn't learn about in school. I learned from my parents. And because we are an oral tradition people, that was and still is quite commonplace. So there was this whole other supplemental education that you got because, you know, PWI's standard education was not going to provide knowledge of yourself to you. Um, And I just wanted to give, you know, more context. I felt like it could be of, of, of great help. And also the fact that some of this stuff kind of undergirds the marginalization of African-American composers as part of the American orchestral canon. Mm. You know, you have folks practicing these high arts from way back, you know? And so we hold these truths speaks to that. It's using poetry from the 1800s, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, through to um, Claude McKay in the Harlem mm-hmm. Renaissance. Right. So, and that was the focus of of that work because it's 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 just work that I've been circling around for a while. I love that you shared, you know, the reality that so many of us, our education about Black music and Black history and Black literature, it it, it was home. I mean, I, I think about yeah. my my mom's in the in the interesting thing if i can add to that is not only was it home but it wasn't off limits to us right mm-hmm. so any book that my mom had in her collection any yes. record that she had in her collection it was mine to share and partake in and dance to and listen to while we cleaned the house you know and- a wonderful story hmm? when i was working on this piece my mother-in-law shared with me her mother's copy of Paul Lawrence Dunbar's book of poetry. And it was, it had an inscription and it, I mean, it was so delicate, like it's in a plastic bag, you know, but right. to be able to touch it and have that tangible experience was really something. Exactly. Like the way it's passed down. And it's, it's so interesting because it's like, at least for me, I think about, I, I didn't really even think about genre. I never had to think about genre until I stepped out of my home because in the same home where we listen to funk, we also listen to hip hop. We also Mm -hmm. listen to gospel. So for me, you know, black music is black music. I never Mm -hmm. really had to contend with this idea that some black, some music is black music and some, you know, isn't for us. And I never had to contend with that until I left the house. So, um, I I just love you for that. And and thank you so much for, for bringing us there. Welcome. Talk to us about what you have going on and, and uh, what's what's in the pipeline for you. My website is tamarcolly.com, but a couple of things that will be happening in 23. One is um, my first full-length theatrical stage piece, 
um, conceived and directed by Bill T. Jones um, called Watch Night. I'm the composer for, and mm -hmm. it will have its premiere at the new Performing Arts Center at Ground Zero, the Perlman Arts Center. Oh, wow. Um, I, last year I debuted at the end of the year, a song cycle that was commissioned by Beth Morrison Projects called Melancholy Ghosts and Other Mothers, um, featuring the poetry of Lola Ridge, um, Gwendolyn Bennett and Jesse Redmond Fawcett. And I'm going to be releasing a 10 inch um, recording of that work. Um, what else? I've got another another um, opera digital short coming. And yeah, I mean, I like to go in deep, you know, go into the lab, go into the workshop. And then, you know, I like to, to, to sow and then reap, you know? Exactly. Exactly. So reap and eat. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's what we are here for. The film is Little Richard, I Am Everything. It recently made its uh, debut in the documentary competition at the 2023 Sundance Film Festival. It is directed by the amazing and talented Lisa Cortez. And Tamar Kali is the film's composer. And we're so thankful to have you. Um, this film really shines a light on Little Richard unapologetically as human, which is something that is is unfortunately still radical and revolutionary when we talk about Black music and Black artists. And so we're just so happy that you were able to spend some time with us here at WBGO and uh, and talk about music and Black music and artistry and, and everything that you have in the pipeline. Thank you so much. <laughs>